Hello and welcome back, or welcome for the first time. Um, today I'm going to be throwing a five pound angular base, which is just to say that instead of being like a perfectly round shape, it's going to have a bit of an angle in the middle. So I'll start by weighing out the clay, going through my wedging process. For any amounts of clay larger than a pound, I'll be spiral wedging it. I'm working on just that small little ball of clay at the top that you can see there and it just makes it that much easier than working with a whole five pound ball of clay. Really I'm just wedging one pound and then it kind of returns into itself. Maybe in the future I'll do like a how to spiral wedge video but yeah it just makes it way easier for any larger amounts of clay. So now that I got all those air bubbles out Hopefully, I uh, will begin to center. With these larger lumps of clay, it's super helpful to sort of center the clay while it's on the wheel head before you start throwing. And I just kind of push it down into place slowly, uh, just using like the force of my hands to kind of spin the wheel head until it feels like it's somewhat in the center of the wheel. That sponge that I'm using there is just because this is you know, I don't have much of a splash pan with this Soldner wheel, so that sponge soaks up a lot of the water just while I'm throwing. Um, all right, yeah, so start the centering process. I'm just kind of pushing the clay down, getting it nice and suctioned onto the wheel, make sure it's not going to go anywhere, and now I'll start coning up. I keep reaching for water because I can feel dry spots as I'm starting to cone up the clay, and one of your main enemies anytime you're throwing is going to be a dry spot. They will immediately knock you off center and you're not going to have a good time. So now while I'm coning down onto center, I'm using my right fist and pushing that clay into the left hand, my left palm, to get it onto center. And all the while I'm leaning forward with my body weight and really just pushing that clay down onto the wheel. And as soon as it's center, you'll feel it in your hands. I don't really know how to explain it. It's just kind of a feeling, you know, it's not going to be wiggling around. It's just nice and centered. So with these larger lumps of clay, I'll start pushing in with my two thumbs and then I'll kind of adjust and use my index fingers because my two thumbs can only reach so far and with my index fingers I can push down a lot further to the base of that wheel head and get the depth of my base to where I want it to be. Such an important part of opening up your clay after you have it centered is making sure you have a really nice flat base. It's going to help you so much when you're pulling up the walls, especially with these larger amounts of clay. It's so much harder anyways to be moving up all of that material. And if you have a nice flat base, you can kind of see from this angle here, I'm starting out with that 90 degree angle, and as soon as I start pulling up my walls, it's just gonna make it easier to get all that clay up. So for this first pull, I'm really just trying to even things out. I'm not trying to get an incredible amount of height from this pull. I just wanna adjust the walls so I can feel an even thickness from my base to the top of that cylinder. I'll compress the rim. You'll see here through this whole pulling process and trying to get the height that I want, it's going to be a lot of pulling up the wall and collaring right after, making sure when I'm collaring that the clay is nice and wet on the outside. I don't want to be sticking while I'm collaring because like with anything, those dry spots will just throw you off center. Collaring, you know, the whole point really of this whole collaring pulling process is to make sure that your your clay, your cylinder isn't going to spread out. You want to make sure it's always being coned in. You can picture like a triangle. You just want it to stay coned in. Right there, I started to feel a dry spot mid-pull. Not ideal, but instead of getting thrown off center, I decided to re-wet the clay and then I'll finish out my pull. So yeah, you know, at this point I think I've, this is my second pull. Um, I'm not too worried 
about how many times I'm pulling up the clay. I just really want to get the, the height that I'm trying to achieve and make sure these walls are nice and nice and even. So yeah, just wetting the clay again, gonna collar it up again, keeping the top of my cylinder towards the center of the wheel. It's so much easier to keep that top towards the center of the wheel as soon as it starts to spread out and do a bowl shape that you're not gonna be able to put it back that easily. So at this point I'm really going for some more height here. I'm trying to really just get that clay as tall as I need it to be. At a certain point, while I'm while I'm throwing up this cylinder before I start shaping, there is the possibility of overworking the clay getting it wet, throwing it up, getting it wet, throwing it up, that repetitive process. The more you overwork the clay, the less the particles are going to be aligned, the easier it is for that clay to flop or twist or have a thin spot somewhere. And you'll see on this next pull uh, what that looks like. So I'm standing up here just to get a little more leverage because there's only so high I can go while I'm sitting down. So you'll start to notice a twist in this cylinder starting right there. And this could be bad news. This could completely flop your pot. Basically, you know, the clay got overworked. It got too thin in that area and it's starting to twist up because the top of the clay is a lot heavier than the bottom right there. There's more material in the top than that section. So I'm going to stop, I go back with my rib, and I'm going to compress that clay against my rib and get it smoothed out, sturdy it up, make sure I have a nice solid foundation again to be working off of. And at this point I can go back and I'll re-wet the clay and I'll cone it again because I, I wasn't really happy with the height that I'd gotten but I wanted to save it. I wanted to make sure that twist wasn't going to totally collapse my pot so now I can feel comfortable getting it wet again, collaring up, and then I'll just finish out with, with one more pull to get that height that I need. And at this point, I'll kind of start shaping, pushing out the clay a little bit while I'm pulling it at the same time. Just keeping a nice, steady pace with that wheel head. Moving my hands evenly, keeping a nice even pressure. And finishing up that top pole. While I'm working on this piece, I'm making sure to leave a little more clay at the rim because I want to be able to pull out pull out the the neck of this pot towards the end and now I'll start the shaping process and I start with my with my hands I'm not using a rib yet it's easier I think to be shaping a piece and pushing out just with your hands I think I have a lot more control than when I immediately just go for a rib I'll get the general idea of my shape and then I'll go back with the rib and kind of compress the clay and finalize it. So you can see there with this angular piece I threw up to a certain point I didn't throw up but I'm throwing up the clay to a certain point basically you know around the halfway section of this cylinder and you can see that angle already starting I'll go up to the halfway I'll stop and then I'll finish pulling the clay with like basically it feels like I'm working on two different pieces of clay or two different sections of the pot at this point you know I have that bottom section and then I have that top section so again I'll be shaping that bottom section shaping it out shaping it out getting to that middle point of the pot and trying to get that angle that I want to achieve. So then I'll stop there, stop about halfway, 
and then I'll finish out my pull in the second half. So I'm kind of splitting this piece into two sections to get that that desired uh, angular look that I'm going for. It helps me to think about it this way, and it helps just with the whole shaping process. Like, all right, here's my bottom section, and there's my top section. So at this point, I have a rough outline of my shape, and now I'll go in with a rib and really compress that clay, get that slip off of the pot, and really finalize the shape that I'm going for here. Same idea, I'm working on that bottom section of this pot, and then I'll stop, and then I'll move to the top section. And always with the rib, you want to be pushing the clay into the rib with that inside hand, not pushing that rib into the clay. So you can really start to see the angular shape of this pot. Once you know you go back with the rib, you really finalize the whole form. It's, it's really starting to take shape at this point. So I'm just going back over my bottom part, my bottom section here, pushing it out a little more with that inside hand into my rib. And then I'm gonna go back on that top section and do the same until I get the shape that I'm going for here. A rib, you know, the whole point really of a rib is to strengthen your piece and shape it, strengthen it, you're compressing that clay, you're getting that slip out of there, you're finalizing the shape, you're smoothing it out, you're getting that grog, you know, out of your piece. Well, not out of your piece, but you're just really finalizing the whole form. I'll take a step back, get eye level, see what I'm going for here. Even though I'm, I'm throwing with a mirror, you can kind of see it on the bottom right, that mirror which is super helpful. I keep saying super helpful about everything, but the mirror is <laughs> such such an important part of throwing for me. If I can just look straight ahead instead of constantly bending over and constantly you know, moving my body in these weird positions and hurting my back, the mirror just kind of eliminates all of that. But at the same time with a piece this big, I want to be able to step back and see my pot. So at this point, the bottom the bottom of my piece I'm pretty happy with and I'll start working on that top that top section only I'm, I'm not gonna go back to the bottom here I'm not gonna touch it anymore I'm happy with it I'm just gonna start thinking about the rim of my pot and the finishing touches I left that clay in the top of the pot so once I was at this point I could pull up the walls a little more pull up the clay a little more get just a little more height that height out of the clay and be able to shape out the rim. Initially, with with these angular pieces, it always it always feels like it wants to be a jar to me, like it needs a lid. But with this one, I wanted to kind of play with it a little bit and and form that rim to be more of like a vase and really flare it out. Yeah, I'm just pulling that, that clay over the top of my right finger, flaring it out. I kind of go back through a few times, wetting the clay, making sure it's not sticky, and pulling it up a little bit, and getting that just that nice curve that you want with the top of the pot. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that shape. You know, it makes it makes sense. I the top of my my pot aligns with the base. Um, going with that chamois, just smooth out the rim, and there we are. There's there's the pot. I'll let it dry for a couple days until I'm ready to trim. And yeah, you can time travel here a little bit. This is actually a different. A different vase that I had worked on, but it's the same idea. Another angular form. This one I actually threw on a bat, so it was easier to get off the wheel head. So I'll just cut it off that bat, get that bat out of there. You'll see that chuck on my lap, and 
I love trimming with a chuck. If I can, it just saves the rim of your piece. It really secures the pot so it's not gonna tip over. These narrow necked, big, bigger vases have a tendency to tip over. If you're trimming without a chuck, instead of just gathering so many lumps of clay on the neck of my pot to keep it in place, a chuck is just gonna it's gonna make it a lot more stable of a trimming experience and make sure your pot's not flying all over the place. So yeah, I'll sort of tap it in center there and make sure the base of my pot is feeling pretty level. That little that little piece that I put on the top there is a rear lens cap. I've had it for so long, it's nothing fancy. I used to use a bottle cap uh, a few years ago and then I have all these camera lenses and rear lens caps and I figured, hey, this is as good as anything else. That really helps me so I'm not pushing through the base of my pot. It kind of distributes, distributes the weight of my finger and I really can't trim without one of these. I'm so used to trimming with it. So I'm beveling an edge into the top of my pot, kind of feeling around for how thin it is, um, where the walls start, and where the base of my pot is the most thin. I'll bevel that edge and kind of create a line in my base with that beveled edge, and then I'll go back through the sides and match up to that line, if that makes sense. I'm trimming down getting rid of any of that excess clay that I can see slash feel. I'm just trying to match up what the inside of my pot looks like to the outside and get rid of any of that excess clay that I don't need and really finalize the shape here. Trimming is, to me, one of the most satisfying parts of pottery, you know, working on a wheel, throwing, whatever you want to say. Um, you really get to refine the shape you get to remove the clay, you get to see those ribbons spinning off. Uh, it's the most satisfying and enjoyable part of the whole process for me. So I'm still just going up the pot, removing the excess, trying to meet that outside wall to the base to where, where my base ends on the inside of that pot, where I can feel, you know, my round base, my flat base ending. I'm just trying to match up the walls to where that, that connection is. It's, I find it, you know, at times it can be really hard to explain uh, <laughs> what I'm doing because so much of pottery is feel and touch, so much of the clay, like how to explain leather hard consistency without just touching it and feeling it is a challenge for me and would be challenging with a medium like clay that is so centered around touch and feel. It's hard to put some of these things into words, so if you hear me stumbling on my words, which I so often do, that is a challenge for me. <laughs> so yeah, taking a step back, looking at my shape, seeing if I got that angle that I wanted. You can see that little beveled edge there, that distinct line that I put in there. So now I'm just going to clean up the base of this thing. I threw the base pretty thin, so I'm really not going to do much trimming. I'm not going to trim an actual foot ring into it, because for the profile of this piece, a foot ring to me doesn't look good. I want there to be a straight line just pretty much going into the floor of the pot. I will bevel a little bit of an edge to give it a little bit of a, you know, just like a height when it's sitting on a flat surface, you can see it lifted a little bit. And yeah, at this point, you know, less worried about removing clay from the base and more just kind of smoothing it out and making sure it's nice and flat. I'll go through with my metal rib, smooth it out, compress that bottom. and. People have mixed feelings about wetting your clay at this state because it does pull some of the grog out and it can make it pretty bumpy. With a metal rib, it it should in theory basically burnish the pot. Like, you know, that little bit of water, if you have a sharp enough rib and you are smoothing it out and really compressing it, you're gonna put that grog right back into that pot. It's not gonna 
It's not going to get pulled out. It's not going to make it rough and bumpy. It's going to burnish that pot, if anything, and just make it really smooth. I've always kind of wetted the outside when I'm trimming and go back with the metal rib. And everyone has their own way of doing things with pottery, as we all figure out. You kind of develop your methods as you go. What works for you works for you. And if it ain't broke, then don't fix it, right? So at this point, it's pretty much finished. I smoothed it out, trimmed it, got rid of most of the throwing lines and trim lines, I should say. I, I like leaving some of them because it's, it's nice for people to know that something was handmade. I don't like a perfectly handmade pot without any mark of the maker. I like there to be something that kind of tells you, hey, that pot must have been trimmed on a pottery wheel because I can see some of the lines. Um, yeah, that's my small rant about that. And there's my uh, tutorial for throwing and trimming a larger angular vase. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.